everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining the Williams Institute for the 2022 election, um, LGBTQ electeds, the LGBTQ vote, and the future of LGBTQ rights. I am very excited and pleased to introduce you to um, Brad Sears, who's the founding executive director at the Williams Institute. Great. Thanks, Carly. Uh, and thanks, everyone. It's great to uh, have you with us here today in what's become a tradition for the Williams Institute, uh, which is to do a post-election uh, wrap-up panel every two years, often uh, dangerously close to the actual election. So uh, uh, although we'll be wrapping some things up, uh, often the election is not quite wrapped up by the time we have these panels, uh, but we want to uh, do our best to provide you the information that we have and the insights in terms of what the election will mean uh, for LGBTQ people and LGBTQ rights. Uh, so we have a great set of panelists today. We're gonna jump uh, right into the discussion. Uh, we encourage you, if you have any questions, uh, to put them in the Q&A uh, 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 part of your Zoom, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. You can just click on that and write your question. And we'll either start addressing them during the panel or have times have time just afterwards. So although uh, the midterm elections are not quite over, uh, it's already turning out to be a historic election, both in terms of the low uh, number of seats in the Assembly and the Senate that have been lost with an incumbent president. I think uh, going back uh, quite a few presidents, maybe to the 50s and 60s since the last time uh, that the, the loss uh, in Congress was so low. Um, and at the height in terms of LGBT uh, Q candidates being elected. Uh, so we're going to start with that by looking at the LGBT vote, uh, the difference that made, and the greater representation of the community uh, among elected officials. And to help us with that discussion, we have our uh, visiting scholar uh, with the Williams Institute, Andrew Flores, who's also an assistant professor of government at American University. And Andrew, why don't we start with the vote? Um, uh, how many LGBT people, LGBT people turned out in this election to vote and what difference did their vote make? Thanks, Brad. Um, so of course we're still like, you know, number crunching in terms of getting all of the data points together. But um, the national exit poll, of course, is one of the primary data sources to help understand what went on, say in the 2022 election. And just as in previous years, um, around 7% of all voters identified as LGBT. Um, and this is um, really consistent with previous elections uh, where LGBT people make up around uh, uh, six to 8% of the electorate. Now, even if that may seem on its face, somewhat of like a small value, um, I think it's really important to remember that in midterm elections, turnout tends to be lower. And yet in, in these midterms and across elections going back since the uh, exit poll started documenting, say, one sexual orientation and gender identity, that LGBT people are a reliable turnout base, that they do show up to elections and they tend to overwhelmingly vote uh, for the Democratic candidate. Um, and this is consistent with this year. So the national exit poll showed that about 84 percent or say about five out of every six LGBT voter supported the Democratic candidate. That's an immense voting block, say, for the Democratic Party, um, and uh, uh, and kind of reveals kind of a, a political solidarity um, that a lot of LGBT people have um, when it comes to their vote decisions. Uh, there are some unique or interesting like differences, though. So um, we can't really disaggregate LGBT, but you can look at the vote, say, of LGBT men and LGBT women. And what I will say is that LGBT women are really a defining factor in the 2022 election. There were the exit, according to the exit poll, 91% of LGBT women supported the Democratic candidates. Uh, um, uh, the number slightly lower for LGBT men, uh, uh, where that's only 78%. But it's important to note that um, uh, across the board, what you're seeing is a huge margin uh, in favor of the Democratic candidate. Now, even though I say that this is like seven percent, you want to think of you might think of as a small number. In this election, what, I think one of the defining characteristics of this election is that there are a lot of close races, um, and uh, so many close races that I actually couldn't even sit down to count them all <laughs> until today. Um, and uh, and it's in those really really close races that having a solid block of LGBT voters could tip the scales for candidates and what those outcomes would be. Um, and so it's important to think about the magnitude of that vote and how important that vote is in 2022 
And if we're looking at the Senate runoff in Georgia, how important that vote will be uh, in that election coming up in December. Um, uh, um, and also, uh, there was all this discussion about the potential of this, quote, red wave um, that really didn't materialize in the 2022 election. Um, and uh, I was being a little facetious when I wrote my notes, but I said, well, uh, in addition to there's a, the potential of a, wave, a wave, I say that there's like a rainbow jetty <laughs> uh, in sense of like, you know, calming that wave down in terms of being maybe the, one of some of the deciding factors uh, in these close, close elections. Um, and so, of course, the dust is still settling, but um, what we've learned from the 2022 election is what we continue to see about LGBT voters, uh, consistent, reliable turnout. Um, and a consistent uh, uh, large share of LGBT people supporting the Democratic candidates uh, in their various races. Yeah, so Andrew, I know in the last election, there was a lot of attention on Black voters and particularly Black women voters and the strength and loyalty of their support to the Democratic Party. And then whether that translates uh, into uh, policy initiatives by elected officials that are that are responsive to those votes. Um, it, it, I, I actually think the, the percentage of Black women voting Democratic in, this, in the exit polls is about 88%, so that 91% I had nerd, uh, but that sounds uh, like uh, lesbians and bisexual women uh, uh, and trans women might be even higher. Um, uh, what does that mean for elected officials? Do they need to be more responsive uh, to, the, to this vote? Well, uh, as always, it's a, 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 a legitimate question, right? It's like, um, there's always a concern when it comes to say, underrepresented or marginalized groups and whether or not elected officials will actually deliver policy for them, right? Um, but uh, uh, um, it's important to note that LGBT people are one, yes, a reliable turnout voting bloc for the Democratic Party, uh, but then they're also much more politically engaged uh, across the board. Um, and so when it comes to say, holding feet to the fires of the elected officials and actually trying to get them to deliver on policy, uh, uh, that LGBT people tend to be much more active in those processes and much more engaged. Not everyone, of course, but it, uh, but if you just look at just uh, rates of donating donating camp uh, to campaigns, turning out to rallies, going to a bunch of political events, you know, reaching out to your congressperson. From the data points that we have, we just know that LGBT people are just much more engaged. Um, and so, when it comes to uh, electing Democrats and then also say electing say LGBT people. Uh, I think there is some kind of return on, uh, say, that investment into what's going on in the political campaign. Yeah, that's great. And of course, we know that many of those LBT women are women of color. Uh, the, many of them have kids and share uh, a policy agenda around family, particularly families living in poverty uh, that 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 elected officials uh, should and can be more responsive to. I want to turn from the actual vote uh, to, I think, what was a record in this election, which was the number of LGBTQ uh, people who were elected. Um, can you tell us more about that and, and kind of what difference that representation can make? Oh, my goodness. So, yes, uh, uh, everyone talks about like the 2020 election as being defining the, like, the rainbow wave. And yet we continue to see that the rainbow wave continues to happen again and again. We had, uh, according to current estimates, uh, we had uh, uh, over 678 out LGBT people running for office. And of those so far, because, uh, you know, some, 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 some have not yet been decided, uh, about 340 at least have gained elected office, right? Um, and this is important for numerous reasons. Uh, uh, having someone who is out and LGBT in uh, public office serves so many roles, not just in terms of being a policy advocate, say within legislature to push or move, say uh, uh, policies in various uh, ways that might be supportive, say of the LGBT community, but also to offer uh, the, a perspective about who can be considered in the, in the making of policy. Uh, um, at times it's like, what, what as you mentioned earlier, around poverty and housing and things like that, what role or what, what, how do, does the crafting of that policy benefit, say, or address or considers LGBT people, right? And so having those people in those, in those spaces helps change the dialogue that people may have around these policies. The classic phrase in policymaking is that if you're not, if, um, if, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the table. Uh, and so having that place, having that and taking that space is it very much important. Um, and uh, uh, um, and it's, there's also 
other ways that out LGBT elected officials can make man, uh, uh, meaningful changes. Part of this is also about looking at potentially, say, uh, legislation that might be harmful to the LGBT community and trying to step in and really trying to stop that legislation from advancing. Um, and additionally, out, having out LGBT elected officials also serves as uh, a symbolic motivator for maybe other LGBT people who may have not run this time, but now may have inspiration from seeing people gain that elected office and be motivated to run next time. Um, and that's why I'm thinking like we have these rainbow waves, but these rainbow waves continue to happen, uh, almost like we reached a tipping point per se, uh, uh, in terms of getting uh, people to go and run. Uh, and California is on the precipice of maybe having, it's not uh, set in stone yet, of having 10% of uh, uh, all legislators being out LGBT identified, uh, which is uh, an impressive feat, an impressive number. Uh, uh, everyone talks about the underrepresentation of LGBT people uh, in elected office, and we're seeing that these dynamics are quickly changing. Yeah, ra uh, rapidly, rapidly. And so I, I think there's a good message there that our votes are important. But as you mentioned, that continued engagement, uh, both as donors with policymakers and running for office. Um, well, uh, uh, one of our uh, one of the people who's about to make that 10 percent a, re a reality is former executive director of Equality California and uh, current candidate and leader uh, in the race for the 51st Assembly District. Uh, here in California, uh, Rick Sabur. Um, and so um, I, th I think it's not called yet. So almost looking good, but uh, we'll be congratulating you soon. Um, uh, assuming uh, assuming the vote continues to keep coming in uh, like it's coming in. Um, what are you, what are your some of, what are some of your plans if you uh, are joining the California legislature with this uh, potentially ten percent of LGBTQ elected officials? Uh, what are your some of your plans in terms of moving LGBTQ rights forward? So, um, so first of all, thank you, Brad, for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I'm a longtime fan of the Williams Institute, um, and I'll say that you know one of the things that's really, I think, been um, um, a great symbiotic relationship is that the uh, Williams Institute, you know, is really responsible for undertaking incredible research um, and policy research and. You know, while we were at Equality California, I think every report that would come out from the Wood Institute, we'd take a quick look at it and figure out, so, okay, what is the legislative impact that, um, and what does this tell us we need to be doing for our community? And so, um, you know, the Wood Institute is an incredibly important resource for those of us um, that were, have been advocates and will continue to be in my new role in the California Assembly. Um, one thing I also wanted to say uh, in terms of just the election of folks before we get into it a little bit is that you know, we had an incredible victory with, you know, I think it'll look like there'll be 13 members of the uh, California legislature who are members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and that's out of 120 um, legislative seats. So it looks like we will be exceeding the um, the 10% mark, which means we're the, we'll be the first state in the country to do that. Um, the disappointing thing, though, is that in LA County, we're losing much of our legislative uh, LGBTQ legislative representation it's a um, and so I think that we as a community really need to be focusing on continuing to build leadership and support candidates in LA County um, if you think about it um, uh, there will be two of us it looks like that will be uh, that will be um, elected to the legislature um, that is actually fixing a really horrible dearth of representation. I mean, we've always had one or two people in the LA County Legislative Caucus, you know, first Sheila Kuehl, then Sheila Kuehl and Jackie Goldberg, then Jackie Goldberg and um, John Perez, then John and Ricardo, and then no one. And now, um, so, you know, we had zero representation in the legislature for the last several years. Uh, now it's looked like we're going to have two. The counterpoint on this, though, is that you know, we had two members of the Los Angeles City Council. It looks like now we'll have zero. We had a member of the Board of Supervisors. Now it looks like we'll have zero. We had the mayor of Long Beach. He's going off to um, to Long Beach. And so we really do need, we're going to be the major, the only major metropolitan area without representation in our major cities and local government. So anyway, just a, you know, just a caution, I think, for us to focus on. Um, and then in terms of what I want to do, um, you know. Actually, actually, Rick, can I ask you one other question before you jump into that? Because um, yeah. I, I think I think you might have some perspective, perspective on what it means to run as an out candidate uh, uh, that is helpful to share because you ran for Congress in 1996, um, I believe then as the first 
openly gay kind of non-incumbent to, to run. Um, and so I wonder if you could just share your thoughts on kind of uh, the journey from, from that campaign and experience in 96 and what it meant to be an out gay candidate to what it means today. Uh, I mean, it was a, it's a very different uh, time. You know, this was over 20, what is that, 20, more than 25 years ago that it ran the first time. I mean, you know, uh, in this, this the election cycle, you know, I ran as an out candidate last time. I mean, I was the first out person that ran in a, in a competitive primary, um, but I still had to run in a very different way. Um, you know, I had to be very careful about sort of how we you know, we're always talking about the broader issues. You know, there was always a risk of getting pigeonholed as being only caring about gay LGBTQ issues, all of that. Um, the when the papers covered my race, it was always Rick Zaber, the gay, you know, a gay candidate. I mean, that was like, you know, that was the main thing that defined me. Obviously, it's very, um, very different now. And of course, then I was sort of the challenger in that race and was the I was not the front runner in this race. You know, I enjoyed the status of being a front runner, which I think is in part sort of the maturation of our community. I mean, it's, you know, we've been building um, bridges and alliances with folks in labor and the business community and the progressive groups that are outside the LGBTQ space. Um, and all of those things have, I think, made our candidates much more um, much more competitive and, you know, given us experience that I think benefits us and that the public recognizes. Um, so, you know, it was a, it was a very different, uh, a very different kind of race. I remember um, at one point, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in the, um, in the race before where, you know, we were getting death threats into the, into the campaign and I had to put a police escort on my house and a police detail you know, in this race, I'm running in the most LGBTQ district in the whole state. So I remember turning to my campaign candidates and rather than having being a muted, having a muted campaign about LGBTQ stuff, I was like, you know, everyone likes the fact that I've been an LGBTQ civil rights leader. You know, why aren't we gang up my mail? I want rainbow flags all over everything. I want to, I'm proud of what we've done at Equality California. We should be, you know, we knew that that actually helps me with the broader community, not just with LGBTQ people, but with progressives in this district. So, you know, that was a very different thing. That's great. Well, we, I, I know it is, it is still an act of service encouraged to run, but we appreciate that you, you took that on in 1996 as well. And I'm sorry I interrupted you. You're about to tell us some of the things you were going to do, uh, do with the California legislature. So my first LGBTQ plus bill will be the Safe and Supportive Schools Act. Um, it's, um, it's a long time coming. Uh, I know, Brad, you've, we've talked to you about this for ages, and a lot of this has come out of the Williams Institute work, um, where, um, you know, one of the things that has been a goal for our community is really to address all these stark disparities in health and well-being for our community. Um, a lot of people, when they think of schools, they think, oh, we're just trying to stop bullying. Well, yeah, we are trying to stop bullying. That is a really horrible thing that is like one of the out, you know, one of the goals of these bills. But the but the bills have a much broader goal, right? Um, if you look at Williams Institute research, one of the things we know is that LGBTQ people, when you look at almost every measure of health and well-being from housing, homelessness, poverty rates, uh, rates of health insurance coverage, rates of substance use, suicide, rates of engagement with the criminal justice system, all of these things, our community scores low. And if you're a member of our community that is a member of a community of color um, or a person living with HIV, or even a woman, you're at the bottom of these uh, measures. And so that's always been a goal. And so improving the schools has been one of our key um, interventions to try to change all of that. You know, think about it. We know sort of what's happening. We know kids are either being bullied in the schools and end up leaving school, or they may have a hostile home environment. And we know from studies that when that's the case, the person a kid is most likely to go to is a teacher or someone in their school. And so if our schools are not equipped to help these kids and keep them in school and keep them from leaving home, um, then you know that is one of the interventions to break this cycle of kids leaving home, leaving school, um, you know, living on the streets, turning to activities, uh, survival activities that are criminalized. Um, and so if we're going to do that, we need to focus on the school. So my first bill is going to be one that will require LGBTQ co cultural competency training with an intersectional perspective for every certificated school um, teacher and certificated school staff. Um, it's something we've wanted to do for many years. Uh, Governor Brown was not supportive of these things because he didn't like putting mandates on the schools. 
Governor Newsom is much more supportive of these, but the cost has always been great. Um, and what we were able to do on a strategy with Governor Newsom was uh, we passed a budget item and a bill a couple years ago that requires the California Department of Education to do an online uh, LGBTQ cultural competency program that will now be available to every school district. So the cost that will be imposed on the schools is much, much more, much reduced. So that should be ready and on the shelf within the next year or two. And so it's time for us to actually finally move forward and, um, and, and you know, protect our kids in the schools. And uh, one last thing I'll say, and I'm probably running out of time, is that I have personal, uh, you know, personal um, uh, experience with this. I mean, I actually had a daughter who was in school who's not LGBTQ, who, you know, went into her middle school classroom one day, opened up her textbook to the page that she, that they were studying. It was a blank page the day before. And the day she opens it up, there is, you know, kill all the effing F people as you, and um, she goes to her school um, teacher and the teacher basically, you um, uh, sort of sloughs it off. She comes home that night, was really upset, tells me about it, sends an email to the teacher explaining. I said, you know, do you think the teacher really saw what was happening? And she said, I don't know. He was busy. I said, well, you know, you need to pick your time and place. So she sends an email to the teacher explaining what had happened. He sends uh, an email back, says, you know, see, see me after school. She walks into his classroom. He hands her a bottle, bottle of white out and basically says, you're making a big deal out of nothing, just write it out of the book. Now, that is not the way we, and he. this isn't a homophobic teacher. This is a teacher that didn't have training. Um, I can tell you 10 other examples of things like that. And I can tell you that I have LGBTQ kids who don't want to go to their current school, and their current school isn't even participating in the Equality California Safe and Supportive Schools Index, because a lot of the, even the progressive school districts thinks that they don't need to do anything. So we have to do this. It's something that's really important to our kids. It'll, it'll affect kids across the state. So that'll be one thing. Um, second big thing, which I'll just mention, um, not necessarily but there will be a lot of discussion about repeal of Prop 8. Um, we know given what's happening on the Supreme Court um, that there's a big desire to do that. Um, and so I know we're gonna be having a lot of discussions in the LGBTQ caucus, um, discussions with leaders in our community, the major groups that um, are in this space. Um, but I think that there's, um, I think that's gonna be um, something that will be um, the subject of a lot of discussion and a decision soon. Um, it was part of the discussion about whether or not we should include it in Prop 1. Um, and we decided, uh, our community leadership decided that um, the challenge on, um, on abortion rights was so pronounced and that we needed, and, and we wanted, we didn't want to dilute that, that we, and, and um, you know, obviously something on marriage equality will take longer to work its way through the courts that we could wait until 2024. So, um, so that will be a big issue um, as well. Um, but for me, you know, um, the bottom line is I'll continue looking at a Williams Institute reports, um, you know, conf, uh, and, you know, I think as we look ahead in California, where we have such strong civil rights, it's really about doing all the things that we need to do to address all these disparities. And so, you know, there are things that we'll be doing for the broader community. I mean, one of the things I really want to do if there's enough budget in place is really an omnibus um, homeless prevention program that would um, extend rent subsidies to basically folks that actually are facing significant housing insecurity. Um, you know, um, youth who are aging out of our foster care system, 25% of whom um, tend to be um, become homeless and LGBTQ youth are overrepresented in that group, but also low income seniors, uh, times when you know, people who, who have lost uh, a job and unemployment um, uh, is not enough to prevent housing insecurity. Um, and, and also young people who are coming into the workforce at the first time and really can't afford to, you know, are paying 50, 60, 70 percent of their income in rent. So those are some of the things that I'll be focusing on as well. That's great. That's great. And we will we definitely look forward to to working with you on those issues uh, and others. We still have some data collection needs that we'll, that we'll be bringing. Uh, oh, my you. God, I forgot about data collection. I'm like, <laughs> I know you've already worked on it, but we gotta we gotta keep pushing on on, on passing it and getting it, getting it implemented. So we we appreciate that. Um, let's uh, so thank you, Rick, um, um, and your your uh, your kids' teachers should know who their parents are. You should know when Rick Zabur is one of your parents before you send you send someone over with 
That's not a big deal. Um, all right, we're going to go on to our legal director, Christy Mallory. And Christy, I wonder if you can uh, carry the conversation from California to some of the other states. Uh, were there any results uh, at the state level uh, in the midterms that opens up uh, new opportunities for LGBTQ rights? Yeah, thanks uh, so much for that question, Brad, and for inviting me to be um, on the panel. Uh, I um, I kind of want to talk about some opportunities that are opening up in states where we're seeing shifts uh, towards electing um, Democrats. And so, as Andrew said, LGBTQ voters tend to support Democratic candidates, um, and that is reflected in their policies. So I am going to focus there today um, with, of course, um, the understanding that this is kind of um, a blunt approximation for what we are going to see because there are uh, growing numbers of Republicans who support LGBTQ rights too. And I think Carrie will address that a little bit. But, uh, you know, a few things that I wanted to mention for everyone to keep their eye on um, in the coming years as a result of this election are uh, the new um, trifectas that Democrats gained in a few states, including Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, and Minnesota. So for anyone who's not familiar with the term, that is when uh, one party holds both houses of the state legislature and the governorship. So uh, what are we looking at in those states? So three of those states, as many of you may uh, already know, um, have very supportive LGBTQ laws and policies on the books. Those states are Massachusetts, Maryland, and Minnesota. Um, so maybe not too much movement here in terms of big gains for LGBTQ rights. Um, but as California and Rick have proven year after year, there is always more to be done at the state level when it comes to LGBTQ rights. Uh, so to just point out some gaps that we may expect uh, the Democrats in those states to fill over the coming years, uh, Massachusetts and Minnesota don't yet have statutes that ban use of the gay and trans panic defenses. Um, so we might see some movement there. That's a policy that's gotten a lot of traction in supportive states in the last few years. Um, we also, uh, none of those three states that I mentioned allow for ex-gender markers on birth certificates. Um, another issue that has um, become more widespread at the state level over the last few years, um, allowing people to have a non-binary gender marker um, on their birth certificates. Uh, so those are just to point out some of the gaps that those states may fill. Um, but I, I just wanted to highlight for a minute that Michigan is a little bit different. And I think we'll see a little more happening there. Um, I think this state offers kind of the most significant opportunity for major LGBTQ rights legislation in the coming years. Um, and just to highlight kind of what's been going on in that state so far, um, Governor Whitmore has been incredibly supportive of LGBTQ rights, um, coming out in support of non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people statewide, uh, banning conversion therapy to the extent that the executive branch is able to do so at the state level. Um, we also see that the state uh, Department of Civil Rights in Michigan has been interpreted their sex non-discrimination law to protect LGBTQ people. Uh, that policy has been around for a few years. The state Supreme Court recently followed suit saying that yes, the state sex non-discrimination law should be interpreted consistent with Bostock to protect people from discrimination based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, I think now with the trifecta in that state, uh, there is a good chance that we're gonna see the legislature codify those protections um, and make sure that they're even more resistant to future um, repeal and or invalidation um, from future administrations or a changing state Supreme Court. Um, and of course, I think there are opportunities for other LGBTQ supportive policies to pass there too. Of the four states I've mentioned so far, uh, they kind of have the fewest of the most common LGBTQ protections um, in place. So, uh, you know, keep your eye on Michigan in the next few years. Um, I also wanted to highlight um, some changes in governor's offices that may impact LGBTQ rights. We know that uh, state executive branch officials have a considerable amount of power when it comes to advancing protections for LGBTQ people. Uh, so I think a few important things to highlight here, part of the rainbow wave that Andrew um, mentioned, of course, is the election of three out LGBTQ governors. Um, we now have the governors of Oregon and Massachusetts. Uh, 
uh, who were just elected two of the first openly LG or openly lesbian governors uh, to be elected. And then, of course, the re-election of Jared Polis in Colorado, becoming the third. This is the highest number of openly LGBTQ governors we've ever seen. Um, so something to definitely celebrate at that level in the state. Uh, then, you know, we also see the re-election of LGBTQ supportive governors in cases where uh, these victories weren't so certain and or they were facing challengers who were openly anti-LGBTQ. So two people to mention in particular here are Tony Evers in Wisconsin and Laura Kelly in Kansas. Um, both of them have issued policies to protect LGBTQ people in the last few years. Um, Governor Kelly, her first uh, executive action was to issue an executive order that protected state government workers in Kansas from discrimination based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. She also notably vetoed two bills that would have limited trans athletes, student athletes ability to participate uh, in school sports teams that are aligned with their gender identity. Um, and similarly, Governor Evers in Wisconsin um, issued executive orders um, limiting uh, conversion therapy uh, on LGBTQ youth, um, supporting LGBTQ workers in other ways, and uh, was the first governor in that state to hang a pride flag on the state capitol building for June, something that he has committed to for every year of his administration uh, in the past and going forward. Um, one other race that I think we're all probably already keeping our eyes on, but if you need one more reason to watch what's happening in Arizona, um, it you know still looks like Katie Hobbs is ahead. As far as I know from what I Googled this morning, the race has not yet been called, but anyone else feel free to jump in and correct me if that's not correct. Um, but uh, you know, Katie Hobbs is um, has been an incredible supporter of LGBTQ rights during her time in the state Senate and as Secretary of State. Um, as a state senator in Arizona, she sponsored several LGBTQ supportive bills, including bills to limit the use of religious exemptions to non-discrimination laws, to advance non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people, um, to amend state statutes to be more inclusive of LGBTQ families and same-sex couples and more. Um, she was also the first Secretary of State in Arizona to hang a pride flag on the state capitol building. It was quickly taken down. Um, she issued a tweet after that saying this just proves there's more to be done, and I think she will show up with that promise um, if she wins um, the race there in Arizona. So I think my key takeaway here is there are two states to really keep your eyes on in the next few years. They are Arizona, if Katie Hobbs is elected governor, and Michigan with the trifecta there offering many opportunities to advance LGBTQ rights. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chrissy. That was very helpful. Um, you know, I have a uh, historian at Princeton, I think, over the weekend said that Biden was one of the most underestimated our uh, presidents in history, I think replacing James Polk uh, for that honor. Um, uh, obviously, you've been working a lot with the Biden administration, and we're going to have another election uh, in a couple of years. But uh, given that he is an incumbent and, and inflation and gas prices, this was great election for Biden. Um, what, what potential is there for continued executive action in the next two years? Yeah, so I think that is exactly right. I mean, President Biden obviously has had to deal with so much um, during these last two years, but throughout this time, he has made um, advancing and securing protections for LGBTQ people a key priority in his administration. Um, I think we will see that continue. Um, in the last few years, a lot of his focus has been on um, reversing harmful Trump era policies that were put into place that undermined LGBTQ rights and even enshrined uh, discrimination against LGBTQ people in a lot of ways. Um, so that in itself is very important and a huge job. Uh, but the Biden administration has not only undone a lot of those policies, but has actually um, moved the needle forward in terms of advancing and expanding protections for LGBTQ people through, through um, federal administrative policy. 
Uh, and I expect that this will continue. I think there are some top priority areas that the Biden administration has already identified and they will continue to do um, work along these lines in the next few years. Uh, one of those is around um, really agencies doing everything they can to make sure the Bostock uh, Supreme Court decision is fully implemented throughout the federal government. So what this means is um, agencies and, and President Biden has issued an executive order to this effect, directing agencies to ensure that they are interpreting and enforcing every statute uh, that is, you know, within their power to enforce uh, that prohibits discrimination based on sex to also prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So, of course, for those of you who are familiar with the Bostock decision on its face, that decision only reached Title VII, the federal employment non-discrimination law. Um, but as many courts have held since, um, there is no reason to limit that interpretation to that law. Uh, the reasoning stands for every law that we have across the federal government and state governments that prohibits discrimination based on sex. So it is now up to the agencies to come in and say, yes, we are going to interpret and enforce these laws to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity as well. And we've already seen key actions taken um, by some major, major federal agencies in this direction, including the Department of Health and Human Services, ensuring that the Affordable Care Act's non-discrimination provision is interpreted to protect LGBT people, uh, the Department of Education interpreting Title IX to, pr to protect LGBTQ students in schools, um, the Department of Justice issuing guidance on ensuring that laws are interpreted and enforced to protect LGBTQ people. Um, another key priority of the administration that I think will continue back to Rick's conversation again uh, is around um, ensuring that federal surveys and data collection activities include questions about sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, this ensures that, that the LGBTQ population is adequately measured, is ad adequately considered in um, policy making, that agencies have this data available to them. Um, to figure out where disparities continue to exist, um, that researchers have this data available to them. This is data that we desperately need. We're constantly uh, confronting limitations of existing surveys because they don't include questions to identify LGBTQ people. So I think we will see more movement here in the next few years too. Uh, one other area I wanted to point out where I expect um, some more progress to be made is around um, gender marker changes. Um, the federal government has been doing a lot to update their policies to allow people to have a streamlined process for changing a gender marker on identity documents uh, and allowing for a non-binary option across federal documents, um, such as passports and social security records um, and other ways that uh, people interact with the government, um, ensuring that those records match their identities. I mean, then I guess one more thing, if I have one more second, is that we've really seen a commitment by uh, President Biden to support LGBTQ youth um, in a variety of ways. This has been a key priority of his since he ran. Um, and I think he is really following through on that with an executive order that specifically uh, targets policies supporting LGBTQ youth and advances protections in other ways. And I think we will see the Department of Education, HHS, other agencies that have a lot of contact with youth continuing to drive those policies forward. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, we're now going to turn to our faculty director and the McDonald Wright uh, Chair of Law with the Williams Institute, uh, Carrie Franklin. Carrie, Christy just talked about some of the executive actions that could happen in the Biden administration. Um, I know we're uh, not quite done with the race, the House races, but um, are there any opportunities either kind of in this lame duck section uh, session or for the next section of Congress in terms of LGBTQ rights? Uh, thanks, Brad, and thank you to all my co-panelists and to everyone <clears throat> watching. I'm really um, happy to be here, especially given what happened last week and relative to what could have happened. Um, it's delightful to be able to talk uh, with you all in this environment. But I do want to, I'm going to start with a note of caution or hopefully sort of um, galvanizing note of caution about what the next session will be like and why it's important to move right now. Um, although the Democrats held on to the Senate and that is enormously consequential in a number of ways, the Republicans look like they're going to take the House. 
So I just want to point out that there's going to be a tough environment in the next Congress um, because the narrow, you know, in a way, the narrow margin will empower the far right Republicans. And they are certainly already out saying the far right members, the House representatives are already out saying, you need us to do stuff. So we're going to extract a lot of concessions. This is people like Marjorie Taylor Greene talking to Kevin McCarthy. If he's the leader, you know, I, I want to get back on all my committees and I want this and this and this. And he's thus far seemed very receptive to those demands. And one of the things about those House members on the far right is that anti-LGBT is a big part of their agenda, right? So they're already out saying, we are going to pursue uh, what's called, I think Marjorie Taylor Greene's bill is called Protect the Children's Innocence Act. And this would bar uh, gender affirming care, medically recommended, doctor approved, you know, uh, all of the AMA, all, all those kinds of no are so important for people to protect their innocence. That would be banned under her view. She's also trying to pass a don't say gay bill nationally, right? She's got a whole agenda. There are going to be riders put on appropriation bills that are anti-LGBT. There's going to be a lot of work to be done in the next Congress to fend off all of this uh, empowered feeling on the far right and attempts to bring bills and put riders and just harass and reduce the rights of LGBT individuals, which is one of the reasons I think it's important for Congress to act now while they can on some pieces of legislation. And I'll highlight one, which is the Respect for Marriage Act. So the Respect for Marriage Act, uh, contrary to what I think a lot of reporters are reporting, it doesn't actually require states to continue to make same-sex marriage available. But here's what it does. It requires the federal government to respect same-sex marriages. It requires states to respect same-sex marriages, both that were per performed in their states legally. So all of the marriages that are already performed under this legislation would have to be respected. And it also requires the states to respect marriages that would be performed in any other states where marriage will remain legal should a state decide to bar same-sex marriage should the court overturn Obergefell. That's what the Respect for Marriage Act is trying to do. And to a significant extent, it preserves the right to same-sex marriage, even in the event of a cataclysmic Supreme Court decision along the lines of Dobbs saying that Obergefell is overruled. So this, the good news about this piece of legislation is it's a bipartisan piece of legislation. 47 Republicans in the House voted for it this summer. It was moving along, but then it ran into the midterm elections. And you had a lot of Republicans in the Senate saying, we don't want to vote for this piece of legislation right before the midterm elections. Some of them were being challenged by further right forces. Some of them were vulnerable. Some of them just didn't want to come out right before the election and stand behind this legislation. Um, but I will say now that the election is over, I think there's some real confidence, some real hope and some confidence being voiced on the part of some senators who support this bill, that it's an easier environment to step up and support this bill when your reelection is no longer on the line. You may be retiring. You may now be safe in your seat. Um, and the political environment is just different. And the thing is, this was a very popular piece of legislation. The latest polling I've seen says 71% of Americans, 71% of Americans support same-sex marriage. So this has broad bipartisan support. It's a popular piece of legislation. Um, I think same-sex marriage, because it's legal everywhere, is now something that people are much more familiar with, they know about. People are already settled into marriages. One thing Williams has already done, and we will do it again going forward, is document how many same-sex marriages there are out there, how many children are living in households with same-sex marriages, all of the kind of reliance, interests, 
settled lifestyles and expectations around marriage. People have built their lives around it now. And I, I think there is a lot of support for encouraging that to allowing that to go forward. So I will say, I think I'm cautiously optimistic, but um, I am, I have some optimism that this can get done, especially if what we're hearing from senators uh, supporting the bill is true. They feel like they need to get 10 Republican votes and they may be able to do that. So we'll be watching that. I just want to, the last thing I want to say about it is I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One is obviously people need the security. People need to not feel like this right could be taken out from under them. They need to feel like their families are stable and secure. That has all sorts of emotional, physical health benefits for families, for children, for couples themselves. And it's critically important to signal that support, particularly given what's going on in the rest of the country with the war on LGBT people in various states. I think it would make an, a, a practical and also a kind of symbolic and emotional sim signal that Americans actually do support LGBT families and individuals and that they support this legislation and that your marriage is secure. And that if that's something you wanna do in the future, you'll be able to achieve that and to obtain that just like every other American. Um, and I also think it's important to show that this, this wave that we're going to see in the spring attempts by the Republican House to come after LGBT people is a fringe wave, right? It is not riding the crest of where Americans are. Where Americans are is the Respect for Marriage Act, right? That is the fringe and it's pushing for unpopular things. And I think it will make it harder for that anti-LGBT contingent to do its work if the American people have spoken in support of marriage. Yeah, and um, I'm going to make an announcement and then Carrie, I'm going to ask you one more question. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, we'll try to get to it. We just have a, a few minutes left, but uh, but you can go ahead and put it in the Q&A section. Carrie, I know you've worked tirelessly over the last uh, uh, several months uh, on Prop 1, uh, which passed. You helped with its drafting. You helped you testified it before the state legislature. Your name was on uh, the voter's guide that was mailed to every voter. And I think you probably talked to every reporter in the state about it. So thank you for all your work on Prop 1. Reproductive rights won at the ballot box um, in this election. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that and kind of comparison uh, to Prop 8 and kind of the history of LGBTQ rights at the ballot box. Um, yeah, so... Um... These initiatives passed, and you are all familiar with Prop 1 in California, but I also want to just uh, hammer home that there were five constitutional amendments or ballot initiatives respecting abortion on the ballot. All of them came out in a reproductive rights friendly way, and I think it's important to note California, Michigan and Vermont explicitly enshrined reproductive freedom in their constitutions for the first time. But I would also highlight Kentucky and Kansas and Montana, where there were anti-abortion propositions up for debate, and they all lost, right? Attempts to ban abortion in state constitutions. And in red states, people shot those down. Uh, and I think, I think there's a lot to be learned about um, what to do going forward in this environment where we are politically and where we are with the court um, about rights that we care about. So I'm going to say a couple of things that I think these campaigns reveal. Um, one, it's important to keep in mind and not get completely discouraged um, about, the, about the court in the sense that in a lot of ways, the court is very out of step with the people. The court is very far to the right of where the American people are. It has an agenda. Um, well, it's certainly an anti-reproductive freedom agenda. We'll have to see to what extent it is an anti-LGBT rights agenda. To some extent, we know that it is. We'll have to see how far the court will go. It is not particularly concerned in democracy or majorities or protecting individual rights. Uh, and so um, 
That is bad news for obvious reasons, but it's also good news in the sense that voters and the people have a lot of room to express their views. And I think it can make a lot of difference when voters in progressive states, and in fact, voters across America, come out and protect rights and do all that they can to show people that their rights are secure, to demonstrate disagreement with the courts, to um, make it clear to legislators that the people aren't where the courts are and that the people want their rights. And what I'm leading into is, I think there's some lessons for uh, LGBT work in some of the Prop 1 experiences we've had. I'll just talk about a couple of things. One thing is we ran a lot of, or they ran a lot of focus groups that I was following very closely, by which I mean the Prop 1 campaign ran a lot of focus groups. And let me tell you, personal autonomy and the right of families to make decisions about their relationships, their children, right? They are not where Dr. Oz is, right? They don't think me, my partner, and the nearby state legislature, state legislator are who should be making decisions about whether I get married or when, when I have kids. That's not a popular message. That's not a popular message on the right, and it's not a popular message on the left. And I think having people come out and demonstrate that, particularly now in progressive states, right? Progressive states can do what we did with Prop 1 in the LGBT space, right? They can come out and pass protective legislation. They can even pass constitutional amendments. They can run these campaigns, which is where the people are which is where the people are. And I think it's incredibly important and powerful to demonstrate that. And um, as I said before, you know, I think there is popularity. I think there's work to be done, but there's a way forward on this idea that um, it creates a lot of suffering. And people in the abortion context were aware if you ban abortion, that creates a lot of suffering in families. It creates a lot of hardship. It, it, it's, it's a cruel kind of way to regulate people's lives, to force them into pregnancies that they don't want to continue. And I think that people to some extent understand, but that we can do a, a bigger and better job of saying, what is it like to be investigated for child abuse when you are trying to do the best thing for your child, you are following the doctor's advice, you are uh, gender affirming care is something that is right for your family. And what that would feel like to, to remove the ability to get this kind of basic and fundamental care for your kid, or then even to be investigated for child abuse for being a good, caring, and responsive parent and doing what you think is best. What would it be like to be a teacher and you have a picture of your boyfriend on your desk and because you're a man, you're now investigated under these don't say gay laws for spreading gay propaganda or trying to sexualize children, right? The journalist Adam Serwer says the cruelty is a point is the point with a lot of this stuff. And I think Americans can understand that. And I don't think they want this. And I think one thing that having these campaigns around legislation or amendments can do is show everybody, hey, this is not what our community wants. We don't stand for this. We want these basic protections and liberties. And I'll just finish by saying, I think it's incredibly important that we step up and do some of this pro-LGBT, LGBT protective legislation and campaigns, because my goodness, it is going on on the other side. And I think it can sometimes leave a misimpression that that's where the people are and that's where the momentum are. And that's not true. I mean, happily, that's not true. I don't think Americans want all of this. I think a lot of this is fringe stuff uh, and it's not where the people are. I think we are where the people are in a lot of ways. And I think it's important to demonstrate that both for the people whose lives are on the line and whose families on their line, but also for other Americans who may not have a sense of, of where everybody is. Um, and so I hope that these uh, reproductive freedom campaigns will be galvanizing, mobilizing, and encouraging to people in states that now want to stand up for LGBT protections.
Great. Thank you, Carrie. And, and that that's, it's great. And it gives us all something that we can do in a role in, in determining our rights. Um, I want to push back a little bit, though, because we have, you know, we have a, a, a big DeSantis win. Um, you know, we have Kay Ivey we, uh, in Alabama, Kevin Stitt in um, Oklahoma, Greg Agabit in Texas. To what extent did their anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, rhetoric kind of play a part in their campaigns and kind of empower legislators in some of the red states to keep moving forward? And Christy, if you want to jump in on this as well. Christy, you go first, because I've just been talking, and then I'll follow you up. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I think um, I think this is something to keep an eye on. I don't want to be too negative here. Um, I also think a lot of this anti-LGBTQ rhetoric matched up in a lot of ways uh, with candidates who were election deniers, um, many of whom did not fare well in their elections. Um, but where we're hearing this from people who continue to get reelected into very high offices um, in their states, I think it is scary. I think um, going back to what some of the other people have said already on the panel is I think this is um, really empowering the far right um, to move their policies forward and creating this impression that um, these are the views held by not only the majority of Republicans in a state, but the majority of people in a state, which is just not true. I mean, Carrie mentioned support for marriage, but this is also true of support for non-discrimination laws that are LGBT inclusive and other laws. Um, we see majority Republican support, majority support, of course, among Democrats and majority support among independents for laws that prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in every state and at the national level. Um, so really, I think um, although these messages continue um, to be spewed in campaigns, obviously these folks continue to support policies once they're in office. I think the trend will die down over time. And I, I, I think this red wave that didn't kind of um, manifest in this election um, shows us that voters are beginning to reject these messages. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, I mean, one of the reasons I'm so proud and happy to be at Williams is I think it is a good thing that it is so much misinformation because I think that's counterable, but we've seen it before. It's counterable by good information. And I also think that they are overextended into the right beyond where their voters are. If you look at the polling on all of these issues, especially if it's framed in fair ways, that is not where Florida voters are. That's not where Texas voters are. A lot of people in Texas were surprised and I think upset when the gender affirming care is child abuse went into effect and Abbott endorsed it. And now the reality of parents potentially having their children taken away or the threats that your children are gonna be taken away from you because you're doing what your doctor, what medical organizations, what you as a parent think is right. A lot of people on the right in Texas are libertarian and they actually don't want the state coming in and doing that to families, right? That's one of the central messages in Texas. And I, I am optimistic, right? I think we're in a panic moment for sure in all the states you mentioned, Brad, we're going through panic. They've decided to run with this. I don't think this level of bigotry runs deep in the American people, even in those states. I believe that, um, that misinformation can be countered when we get the message out about how cruel this is and the kind of communities we'd be living in when teachers are under constant surveillance. I do think we can, and I think we will prevail. So I didn't mean to sound too optimistic. I meant to be saying there are challenges ahead. There's a lot of work to be done, but um, you know, look at the state of same-sex marriage in 1995, right? I think we will get there with good data, with good information, with presenting the fact that these are human beings whose lives you are trampling for some bigoted misinformation campaign's sake. I don't think that will ultimately win. Great. We're, uh, we're kind of out of time. I promised to ask one more question. So uh, I wonder if, if people can be very brief, but we haven't talked about the judiciary at all. Uh, what are the implications of this election um, for the judiciary, I think in particular for judicial nominations? Oh, 
I'll, I'll just jump in and say two lines, which is they're good. The Senate can confirm judicial nominees, right? So if the Democrats had lost the Senate, it was going to be very, very hard for President Biden to be appointing judges for the next two years. Now the Senate will be able to put through judicial nominations. That is unbelievably important. It was that to me, you know, as a lawyer, winning, winning the Senate, holding on to the Senate, enabling those judicial nominations to happen for the next two years, especially since President Trump prioritized, prioritized appointing federal judges. He appointed almost a third of the federal bench at this point. It will be incredibly important in the next two years to get these nominations through. And I think it also opens up just uh, to be um, of the moment, it opens up the lame duck session where it was going to be that they were going to have to try to, all they could do was try to get the judges in before they, um, now they can confirm judges in the spring. So they should focus on the Respect for Marriage Act now. Great. The, the, the other yeah. thing I was going to say, isn't the Warnock um, possibility, doesn't that also provide some more advantages in terms of less shared power in the Senate? Yes. <laughs> Uh, basically, they wouldn't have to share committee roles. They'd be able to chair committees and maintain, say, a, a type of discretion over the policy agenda that they don't currently have as well. Um, and I would say, note uh, in terms of the judicial elections, also if you look at the state level, um, some of the partisan judiciary elections, uh, uh, say like in Illinois, went toward the Democratic candidates. Uh, but then also, I think one of the more important ones is uh, the Kansas Supreme Court had a retention election. And all of the justices that decided in a very pro-abortion rights way gained, uh, retained their seat. Uh, um, so still showing the importance of, say, abortion policy across the board. Great. Thank you. So I think this is a, a different panel than we all anticipated uh, maybe, a, maybe a week ago. Uh, so I'm glad that we were able to share some optimism uh, and some path forwards, both where opportunities remain uh, and in a number of states and localities where there are still challenges uh, that we'll need to push back against. I want to thank all of our panels uh, and the delightful squirrel that joined us in Carrie's window uh, for a great session. And we look forward uh, to seeing you again at our next webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great day.